genetic disorder called arteriovenous um, malformation. Can you tell us a little bit about it and uh, how you sustained it, I should say? Yes. So when I um, was 15 years old, I had one day just symptom of stomach pain. And over the course of the day, it kind of got worse. And then by the end of the night, I couldn't move my legs. So they took me to the hospital and um, they said, well, we can't find anything wrong with you on the surface because this was in 1993. And the only way to detect an AVM is through an MRI. Okay. So it wasn't until the next day after they really did all their blood tests and x-rays and they were like, we don't know why you can't move your legs. Um, they actually did an MRI and they came out and they said, you have an arterial venous malformation. And of course we were like, what is that? <laughs> Um, and they basically explained it's super rare, um, like one in a million people have it in the spinal cord. It's, it's usually in the brain and usually fatal actually, but, um, but mine was in within the spinal cord, which makes it even more rare. And it can, there's some debate now because it's so rare, the research mm -hmm. is still going on about it, but the simplest way to put it is it's similar to an, to an aneurysm, like a blood That's vessel. Not, right. Um, that ruptures, it could rupture, it may not rupture. I mean, it, it, it totally is random. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, when I, when this, happened, that's okay. when this happened to me, the first time um, I learned about it, they said, okay, well, we, the way to describe it is, okay, it might've been there since birth, um, not hereditary, but congenital, and that you had this blood vessel in your spinal cord. And at some point it was probably going to rupture. Mm -hmm. um, and the same goes for any, I mean, AVMs I'm, I'm told can happen anywhere in the body. Um, oh but, but for me, since it was in the spinal cord, it was most likely going to cause some paralysis because anything that touches the nerves in the spinal cord will damage the spinal cord and cause paralysis. So at that point, once mine ruptured, it was like any other spinal cord injury. Then um, I was paralyzed from it and they needed to go in and do surgery and remove it so that it didn't happen again um, because sometimes they can re-rupture um, if you haven't had severe symptoms. Some people have um, symptoms that they can live with um, where they don't want to go in and, and remove an AVM because going inside and doing surgery like that will cause some nerve damage. So if you're not already paralyzed, it's a risk to, to go in and treat an ABM. That's why they're so complicated is because usually you don't ever know if you have one until it ruptures. And then once it ruptures, you're, you're in trouble. <laughs> and the other counter um, opposite of that is you do find out you have one. Um, it hasn't ruptured yet, but it's causing neurological symptoms that need to be treated. And the the alternative for that is to do surgery and it might cause permanent damage that may be worse than the symptoms you're dealing with. So mm -hmm. it's, um, it's, it's still being researched as far as what really causes it. Um, the fact that, you know, they do believe it's congenital and they didn't believe it was hereditary. I think that that's kind of shifting a little bit. I think that might be some hereditary aspect to it. But like I said, they're still researching and still trying to figure it out. Um, so that's kind of where it lands, um, you know, and AVM survivors, they say. And uh, there is a small community of people that I've met along the way that have had AVMs and every single person I've met has, it has affected them differently. Sometimes it's been um, a brain injury. Sometimes it's been, um, something that's caused them a little bit of motor dysfunction. Mm -hmm. It just, it totally depends. And that's kind of one of the reasons why I find the community of people that have AVM so fascinating is because everyone's story is so different. Mm -hmm. um, and even when you have one and, and, you know, know somebody else that had someone, one similar, it's still a completely different journey. Right. No, absolutely. I mean, I mean, every injury is different, you know? Yeah. I mean, every, and every spinal cord regardless, injury. Regardless. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I mean, mine is very mild. Uh, I mean, honestly, well, I mean, I've told you, so you may notice that I walk with a slight limp, but every time I meet somebody for the first time, or they don't know about me, I, on the rare occasion, they will say, oh, like, do you notice, like, you know, you're dragging a little bit of your leg and just say, I walk with a slight limp. Mm -hmm. say the truth but I don't get into the whole thing at first but typically I have to tell them it's very um unnoticeable um, yeah 
So, uh, but yeah, everyone's injury is different. It is. And that's what I think is um, very, very important for everybody to know about disability in general, honestly, is that everybody's story is different, no matter what the diagnosis is, even if it's the same one at the same level, um, there is still going to be differences. Um, yeah, we're all individuals, just like our injuries. Yeah, no, exactly. And our um, disabilities, as everyone that I've spoken to um, say, obviously, including myself, um, doesn't define us as a person. A hundred percent. Yeah, exactly. I think it. I think it enhances us as yeah, people. Of course. Um, but yeah, I don't think it defines us. It definitely is just one aspect of us. Yeah, absolutely. So you were diagnosed with this, or this was sustained when you were fifteen. So you were a teenager, uh, and like all teenagers, we are we are developing at a rapid uh, pace uh, with our bodies, our maturity, our minds and so forth. So being confined to a wheelchair, how did that affect uh, not your maturity in terms of, you know, um, personality and all that, but in terms of maturing with your body uh, and, you know, kind of quote unquote, like fitting in, uh, because that was definitely probably um, a little bit of a struggle, you know. Yeah, um, at the time I thought, gosh, like, why does this have to happen now? <laughs> um, because it was um, a time in my life where I felt like I was finally almost growing into my awkward body. Mm -hmm. um, I was very, very skinny growing up um, and to the point where I was kind of made fun of it um, mm -hmm. and called bones and sticks. And my mom always worried I was like anorexic, even though like, right. I constantly ate. Um, I just, I just, that was, I was really tall and lanky right. and um, there's nothing wrong with that, but I never felt like, um, like I was, that people could overlook certain things about me physically to the point where I always felt a little bit insecure about my physicality. Mm -hmm. um, fast forward to age 15, where I felt like I was kind of growing into my body and accepting it and meeting new people in high school and you know kind of getting noticed by the boys and it was a time in my life where I felt like everything was kind of coming together and then boom life was like oh okay we're gonna um we're gonna throw you in a wheelchair for life and see how that goes and so yeah at first I was devastated because I thought, oh my gosh, how am I going to go back to high school in a wheelchair, much less live the rest of my life in a wheelchair? Um, I had no reference to anybody else that had been paralyzed or um, anybody else that had lived in a wheelchair um, in, in, a, in my personal life, even in my community. So I didn't have any type of oh, this is fine. You can live a normal life and you know, you'll be OK. So for me, it was uncharted territory and that's what made it so scary. And also, like you said, like trying to fit in. So here I am like taking four months out of my first year in high school in 10th grade and leaving. And then people also not really knowing what happened to me. I mean, I was literally in school one day and the next day, like I wasn't. And then people like even my friends were like, what? Like you can't walk? Like, you know what I mean? There wasn't any actual like, story that necessarily happened that made sense to us mm -hmm. because I was super athletic. I was super, you know, um, in tune with my body. So I was overall like very, very, very healthy. And it didn't seem like anything like that could happen. Um, so when, you know, I finally did go back to high school, I remember going into school and people were really excited to have me back. And just feeling that vibe when I went into the school again for the first time in a wheelchair, really set me at ease and then someone made the comment like well she's the same just sitting down and I'm like oh my god yeah I really am and that's when I matured like it was almost in an instant where I realized wait a minute the wheelchair is not me I'm me no matter what whether I'm sitting down whether I'm standing whether I'm paralyzed whether I'm not and that me is still there and I can still cultivate that. And so that meant for me to go back to the things that I love to do, um, go back to school, go back to my friends, go back to doing what I was doing. And once I went back to all those things, me came back in that sense. And I also 
started because of that i started to get to a place where i was like well you know what this is this isn't so bad like maybe this was supposed to happen to me you know maybe this was um saving my life in a lot of ways and maybe this is um enhancing my life in some ways and i started to mature very very rapidly um i, I would say like you know between 10th and 11th grade when I think if I had not gotten paralyzed, I actually would have gone down a bad road, um, oh, wow. a very rebellious one. And this set me on track to really focus on what's important in life and also cultivate the friendships that I really wanted to cultivate as far as what's meaningful, who's going to stay in your life throughout thick and thin. Um, what is what does being paralyzed mean? Like I, it opened up my world as far as a whole community of disability and spinal cord injury, which I had never knew existed before. And that made me more wise, older and more mature as far as the way I looked at the world. Cause I was like, okay, my world is not this little bubble, which is, it's really easy to do that as a teenager, to think that your whole world is your high school and that that group of friends or the troubles that you're having it's so normal because that's all you know um, this just expanded my worldview on so many things and helped me grow up a lot faster absolutely for sure and i think any disability or any medical condition i mean helps you grow up and helps you kind of um rationalize if that's even the right world right world right word uh the you know life in general and what you know for instance identity and what your um you know what your purpose is in life again identity it's kind of the same um because you know other people who um don't have an injury don't have the same type of challenges um, yeah it's fascinating to me because there is this connection between your own identity as a person um, how you fit into your body, because it is part of you. And then also how the world perceives you from an outside point of view when they don't know you. Mm -hmm. And that is such, it's just such a fascinating journey to have something dramatically shift in your physical appearance mm -hmm. and that perception of the world completely changes and what it means for you and how you live your life in order to deal with that. Um, for me, it was trying to break stereotypes because I started to learn that a lot of people thought me now being in a wheelchair was really, really sad and that, um, you know, people should feel sorry for me or, you know, I, I someone told a friend of mine in high school, um, someone that I didn't know very well asked a friend that I knew very well um, if I was like depressed. Um, about the wheelchair and because the guy said she doesn't seem like that upset like you know is she upset secretly about the wheelchair and my friend's like no she's like but she gets upset about the same things we do as you know like, um you know did we what kind of party are we going to go to on the weekend and will it work out you know like i don't know just kind of things yeah. um but that that when I started to realize that it was the world's own perception that my wheelchair was a negative thing or a sad thing, then I was like, oh, wait, now I got to change that, that viewpoint because that's not my viewpoint. And if it's me living it, then, then I can try to quell that um, type of mentality because I think th the, I used to say the hardest thing about being in a wheelchair is other people's perceptions that you can't do something or that you're limited. Um, and the reason is, is because it's really hard to block that out completely. No matter how confident you are, there's still going to be feedback that you pick up from the world and people around you. That's how we are as human beings. Um, you know, there, there are aspects to like not listening to negativity and all that stuff, but mm -hmm. it does come to a place where you realize like you do have to operate in the world and you do have to operate with people and people need to give you opportunities um, across the board for anybody um, in order to succeed and to have people think that you can't and not offer you any opportunities to do something does affect the success of people that um, are perceived as limited. Um, so when you don't believe you're limited in any capacity, it's like trying to fight that um, and say, no, 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 I can do it. You know, like, just give me a chance. I can do it. Um, and I kind of appreciated that journey, um, especially in my own life of, of 
learning that, okay, like I, I am going to educate others and prove to other people by doing, mm -hmm. um, going out and, you know, doing the things that people wouldn't assume I would do. Um, mm -hmm. And sometimes I can get a little bit, um, what's the word, adventurous, or a lot of people think um, reckless. <laughs> right. um, but a lot of that is because I don't want to ever feel that I'm confined or limited by being a wheelchair user. I remember specifically thinking a couple of times in high school where friends would like invite me to something. And I remember thinking, well, that would be really difficult, you know, going to do that in a wheelchair. And part of me like had this fear of like, well, maybe I shouldn't, you know, like, but then every time I had that thought, I was like, nope, I'm going to purposely now go out and do it. And every single time I did, I found a way, even if it seemed like it was going to be a difficult task, of course. always a way to mm -hmm. move through it. And that's one of the biggest lessons I've learned about being paralyzed is mm -hmm. it's all about problem solving and all the problems are solvable. Oh, absolutely. And that's why in this world, you know, there's more inclusion, there's adaptable technology. I mean, you know, you kind of, you know, you name it. I mean, you know, I, I mean, as well as lots of people with disabilities, <laughs> um, I'm just, I mean, I, I just haven't found the one, but now I'm just saying, you know, in terms of like marriage, for instance, you're married. I don't know if you have any kids, but there's other people that have, you know, that have had kids and, you know, you, you, I mean, like, again, like having a disability, is not who you are. You can still live a very fulfilling life. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. You bring that up about kids is because I had always thought I wanted to have kids mm -hmm. and you, I actually didn't before I got paralyzed. I'll say that. Like, I, I actually didn't really like care either way or even really think about it. I mean, I was 15. So, right. but I, but I, but I had the idea that like, that's just something you do. So yeah, eventually I'll get married and have kids. And, um, and I realized that when I got paralyzed, I had even more of a drive to have kids. And it was because people thought I couldn't. And I felt like that's, I have to prove mm -hmm. to society or my friends or whoever that, um, that being paralyzed didn't stop me from having kids. And then, you know, I got married and my husband like, didn't, didn't really want to have kids. I mean, he would have had kids, but I, I, I got to the point where I was kind of like, I, I don't think I want to have kids. And like, it was really hard for me to make that decision on my own when, mm -hmm it was, oh my gosh, am I, am I letting people down? Am I letting society right. down? Or am I letting um, the disability community down by not mm -hmm. having kids, by like perpetuating this stereotype that, um, that people in wheelchairs can't have kids, you know? And so there was this pressure that I felt that I needed to do. And then I thought, you know, why don't I do what's best for me? Mm -hmm. And that was a process in itself, you know, is coming to that decision, especially as a female it's really hard to make that decision when we're ingrained and programmed to think that that's what successful women do is um, have children and having children is a beautiful thing, but you also have to make sure that it's the right decision for you individually. Um, so yeah, so that's where I'm at now. I mean, I'm still a little bit on the fence about it, but like, like I would say like 98% of me doesn't want to have Mm -hmm. I would say human children because I do have a puppy and yeah, no, of course. And a puppy's like a child. So. Oh my gosh. I had no idea. I had no idea. What type of dogs do you have? Uh, he's called a Sholo Eats Queenly, which oh. is, um, a co he's a Mexican hairless, but he's coated. So he's a coated Mexican hairless so and people think he's like a black lab puppy, even though he's full grown. So he's super oh. cute, but he is a handful oh. and yeah, you realize like that's a toddler for life. I mean, no, it is, it really is. for about 15 years. Yeah. yeah. And um, so I, I'm happy with him and <laughs> like um, with the workload that that takes. Yeah, of course. Um, no, yeah. No, absolutely. I mean, and I'll give you light in terms of my life. See, I have a dog. I love her to death. I consider her my child. Yeah, I was 30 and was like, I, I moved out when I was 30 and I, I've always wanted a dog. I had cats and we had hunting dogs, but um, I was like, I'm getting a dog. And yeah, it's like a child. I mean, people are like, oh, you're going home at 1030 at night. I know. Like, yeah, I have to go walk the dog. Or I know. The dog sitter during, you know, if I go I away all day and I can't take them, whatever the case is. 
But um, I actually, when talking about kids and so forth, I'm actually not going to have kids myself. Um, it has nothing to do with my injury. Right, right. Um, it has right. nothing to do with that whatsoever. Right. I, uh, I'm very career driven. And mm-hmm. even though I do have a disability, I wouldn't want to carry my own kids. I mean, of course I could adopt, I could do surrogacy, like there's other options. Uh, but it's just, yeah, like I said, I'm very career driven and it's just something that I would, you know, something that I, I don't want to necessarily, I mean, I love children, but I just would rather focus on other aspects of my life. Um, and having a dog is the greatest thing. So yeah, I think, I don't think it matters. I it think doesn't it, matter at all. I, yeah. I think what matters is that you feel fulfilled. Of course. And, and that means like, even if you want to have kids and you end up not being able to, for whatever reason, this goes for anybody, right. um, finding what, makes you feel fulfilled regardless. And that could be, like you said, adopting or fostering. Um, and my husband, it's um, interesting. He's, he's really, um, he's like a really good mentor um, for, cause he came from a very difficult background growing up. What does and he do? He's, he's actually a business coach. Um, okay, very he, cool. Ironically, he, um, when he was in high school, he dropped out of high school. And um, then, you know, had a GED and then like ended up going to a party at his friend's college and ended up going to college. And then while he was there, he was like, oh, if I graduate college, maybe my high school um, principal will give me my diploma. And so he made a bet with his high school um, principal. And so he got his diploma, but then he also got a scholarship to get an MBA out here, which is why he moved wow. to Los Angeles. So he went from GED to MBA um, and he really overcome a lot of odds, um, especially from where he grew up. But at the end of the day, I think like he really resonates with, with kids that are um, like teen- struggling teenagers. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, sometimes, you know, being a parent, if it's not even your own child, takes on the role of helping other children that, um, that are struggling. And I think kids need a lot of parents of course. And sometimes parents comes into come in different forms. And that's yeah. a beautiful way to still have that nurturing capacity in too. life. Yeah. I mean, I think what's really important more so than having children necessarily in life is having a partner. So you have stated that being paralyzed, uh, is, you know, is your perfect life challenge. Can you uh, describe how you came to this conclusion or quote and what does it mean to you and you know you preaching it to others? The first thought that I had one day uh, when I was thinking about me getting paralyzed as a challenge, I thought, man, like this kind of fits my personality. When I started to think like, cause one of my friends was like, yeah, you know that now that I know you and I've gone through, you know, your paralysis um, with you as a friend, like now, if it, God forbid, ever happened to me, I um, would, would know how to deal. And I wouldn't, I don't think I would be as devastated as you were not having that. And I, I thought about that and she's like, but she's like, I still don't think I could handle it. And I was like, about that and I was and I was thinking like well I wouldn't have thought I could handle being paralyzed if you had asked me before um in fact if you had asked me I would have said oh I'd rather like die um because I didn't think that you could live a happy life in a wheelchair um so but once I got over that and realized wait this is kind of this kind of fits me and the fits my life and I think that every single person Mm -hmm. in the world has a challenge that is made for them. And um, that challenge is made to make them more of who they are and who they're supposed Mm -hmm. to be and also um, make them grow. Mm -hmm. And this did all of that for me and and more. And now at this point, I look back on it and say, like, I'm really glad it happened. It gave me uh, my particular purpose. Now, not everybody would feel that way, um, but I know people that have gone through things where I'm like, oh my gosh, I don't think I could deal with that. And maybe I could, or maybe I couldn't um, handle it, you know, if I was actually thrown it, but you don't know until you deal with it. But overall, I love to figure things out and being in a wheelchair is that it's always finding a new or a cool, innovative way of doing something that may be a little bit different. And I 
I, I thrive on that. So yeah. that it is my perfect life challenge because it keeps me stimulated. I love to be mentally stimulated. I love to grow. I love to think outside the box. I love to do things that people don't think you can do. Um, and so this gives me the opportunity to do that, like almost on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's why it, it fits me. It's awesome. <laughs> I love it. Uh, so you also, uh, put emphasis and uh, are active in raising awareness on the life challenges for people uh, who have AVM. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing uh, and you know the advocacy work? The most important thing about AVM um, advocacy right now is education. Um, and that is because it is so rare and a lot of people get misdiagnosed mm -hmm. um, with it, which causes complications for AVM patients because th the longer you wait, the more damage it will cause. Um, and so for me, you know, this is one of some people have asked me, you know, how come some people end up like walking right away, especially football players that break their necks on the, uh, and when they're playing, it's because one of the reasons they know now that causes more damage into the spinal cord when there's trauma is because of the swelling, right? That's like causing more air, surface area in your spinal cord to be damaged. So they know that like steroid application is a game changer when it comes to um, spinal cord injury. So for me, them waiting a day to even do anything, to even find out that I had an AVM um, did you know, prolong and maybe cause more spinal cord damage. Um, this happens a lot with, um, with other people that, uh, you know, come to doctors with like headaches a lot or, um, you know, neurological symptoms where they're just like, we can't find anything wrong with you. Now that's changing because of technology. Mm -hmm. um, and it used to be when I first got paralyzed, I would go to like a doctor or something and, you know, they would be like, what's an AVM? Like, I don't, you know, I don't, and they're in the me medical field. Now, fast forward, I go to like a doctor and they're like, you have an AVM? Like, that's so rare. And they've actually at least heard of it. Right. Um, but they still know that it's like, wow, I've never known anyone that had one. Mm -hmm. But just like anything else, when there's more awareness and people look out for it more, they know that it's more common than that. And so that helps. So a lot of the advocacy right now is raising money for research. Um, I am a big proponent of a couple of foundations. One is the Aneurysm and AVM Foundation, mm -hmm. and they raise a lot of awareness and a lot of uh, funds for research. Um, and also the, um, the Michael Ryan Zoda Foundation. Um, this was particularly a person who, who ended up dying as a young guy, um, and he had an AVM in his brain. And you know, his, his family has taken on in his legacy to raise money for research and, um, and maybe even a cure. So this is uh, the road we're on for AVM. And, um, but in the meantime, I really want that to be part of my byline or my, um, my story, so to speak, is because there are other people out there with AVMs. And because there are um, so many different complications and so many different stories and journeys. It's really important, I think, that we find each other um, because if it does turn out that it's an hereditary issue, we will want to look out for certain things with mm -hmm. the next generations that come after us. Um, so yeah, it's all important, especially the awareness about it. And um, I'm 100% behind that. So if any, anybody's watching and they yeah. know someone that's had an AVM or they've had one, um, definitely reach out to me because I, I would like to build more of a network of people that that deal with them. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I'm all for it. So mm -hmm. yeah, we can even talk about that. And, um, the and, it, and it's funny because I didn't even, I never really thought about how that played into my identity as a um as someone with a spinal cord injury, um, mm -hmm. as far as describing it as an AVM and making sure that that was in the description of how I got paralyzed. I didn't really put emphasis on that until when, until Push Girls came out. And when Push Girls came out, like the first article that came out about um, the show was like, okay, they said, you know, three, three or four girls, they're in car accidents. And then they were like, and one had a um, it was like a, I think they described it as like a congenital heart disease or something like that. 
<laughs> like it wasn't, it like didn't even describe what an AVM was. And it, it bothered me because I was like, wait, like, no, that's important. Like I, you know, I want that to be, um, you know, put out there in the press because I do feel responsibility to get more awareness about it. So that's kind of how I evolved into becoming more of an advocate specifically for ABMs. That's awesome. And advocacy is always great for whatever disorder uh, anyone has. Uh, Amen. So yeah. I applaud you. Yeah. And it's funny too, even with the the way of describing it, like I don't even I think a disorder is probably the best description of it. Um, but I, you know, some people would say disease, but it's not a disease and it's not, um, it's not really like um, an injury, you, you know what I mean? But it, but the spinal cord was injured. So I'm considered a spinal cord injury. You know, there's so many different variations to, um, to kind of compartmentalize something like that, that, that is still evolving. Um, but yeah, I would, I would describe it as um, a rare disorder that I happen to have. Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, so you are well known um, among other things, but um, for your, or not, I won't say it's yours, but for the reality show Push Girls in 2012 that you were in, uh, which chronicles your life as well as other people that have spinal cord injuries and are wheelchair users uh, day to day, uh, you know, how just, life in general, whatever, you know, your day-to-day -day lives. Can you tell us a little bit about your experience? And do you think that push girls or just in general, uh, you know, the stigmatization around people with wheelchairs, do you think that has been reduced, whether it be through push girls or just um, over the years in general? I always knew that the media would be a super powerful tool to be able to break stereotypes about um, spinal cord injury and especially even the female image mm -hmm. um, of, of women in sp with spinal cord injuries or even any disability. And I remember being 15 right after getting paralyzed and thinking like, gosh, like I feel like this would be so much easier for me to deal with if I just had a role model or not even, even if it wasn't somebody in my own personal life, like someone I could see on TV and mm -hmm. watch and be like, oh, wow, like they're cool. Like if they're doing it, like I could do this, you know? And it was something that I thought, well, if I'm feeling that way, there must be other, mm -hmm. you know, females that, females or males, but like people that, especially young people that get paralyzed or um, develop a disability that have no idea what to do and are looking for those role, those role models. And they may or may not come into contact with them in their individual life. Now more so with the internet because people can reach out to other people um, through social media. But, um, but specifically, I think the mass media is a huge tool because that does reach out to people that aren't necessarily even searching for it. And that means society in general, where I feel like the most advocacy needs to be done is to change their perceptions about disability. Because we are kind of like preaching to the choir when we talk to like our own community, because it's like, oh well, yeah, of course a girl can be attractive and, and date and get married and, you know, work and have a fulfilled life. Of course we know that, but newly injured people or people that have no connection to disability at all do not know that. Um, and so for push girls, when that came about, I was really nervous to do it one for one reason is because I'm a super private person, um, naturally, and, um, I'm really shy naturally. I, I had to get over my shyness growing up because I changed schools a lot as a child. And if I didn't speak up and try to be extroverted, then, uh, you know, I wouldn't have been able to make friends. I don't think so. I had to push myself out of it, but my natural tendency is very, is to be very shy. So all of a sudden I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm gonna have to open up my whole life, um, to the world. And, but I looked back once I had that, that, mm -hmm. that anxiety, I looked back to that 15 year old girl who thought, wait a minute, that's something that I want to do someday. And I was like, well, this is the opportunity to do that. So get over yourself and start to realize that this is for a bigger reason, a bigger purpose. And so, yeah, so that pushed me, um, you know, to go forward with it. And the, the journey was amazing. Um, not only because it was a journey that I got to share with close friends, but 
also to see the reaction that society had because there hadn't been a show um, on television like that before. Mm -hmm. And we really didn't know how it would be received. We didn't know if, you know, people would, there would be a lot of backlash because people would be like, oh, because this was also right when reality TV had started, like was just coming out and it had a really bad reputation. Um, like it was like, oh, that's such trash TV, you know, and our mission was to put a reality show that actually wasn't trash mm -hmm. and something that, you know, would educate and, um, but be interesting to watch. Mm -hmm. So when we first went to the uh, TV Critics Association, when we had to um, pitch our show with the Sundance channel, mm -hmm. they were uh, really nervous because this is the first time like TV critics were going to be able to hear about the show. And from what we were told, they're very, um, they're very critical because they see so many different shows all the time and they're kind of jaded with like what's out there, especially with reality shows that were coming out at the time. But when we went and presented, we were super happy and surprised to know when we got off the stage, our network was like, that was amazing. The whole room was silent. And the questions that they asked, they said like, were perfect. Like one person was like, this is what reality TV show should be, you know? And we were like, yes, yes, exactly. And the press that came out after that was super positive. They got it. They understood what we were doing, what the mission was behind it. And um, it took off from there, which was such a blessing because that's exactly what we had hoped for um, yeah. was to make the difference. And, you know, it's still a slow process in the entertainment industry to get more exposure. Um, the exposure is coming slowly but surely, but I think Sundance Channel was amazing because they did take a risk and they stepped outside of the box. And I think that needs to happen more in Hollywood with um, networks, producers, casting directors, the whole group, because that's where we're going to make more progress. Um, mm -hmm. That is, people can't stay in their comfort zones and make change and, and do better. It's just, it does not going to happen. You got to take those risks. And luckily we did and it was yeah. successful. So hopefully it'll be more stuff like that out out there and you know even the 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 i mean honestly the the one negative thing that i can think of that people thought was well they they can't really be in wheelchairs like their legs aren't skinny enough or something and i'm like uh have you seen the scene of me getting in the pool <laughs> like right my legs are pretty skinny i don't like wear short skirts all the time and so people like you know may not see them all the time but like hello like we we're we want to wear heels we're going to wear heels we we can that's the thing mm -hmm. we can do what we want to do so i think that some of that was well they can't they can't be real i mean even when we were in public sometimes one one time um me and uh, tiffany were sitting like on on this wall and someone walks by and was like that's really mean you shouldn't be playing in wheelchairs like that like and we were like, okay, um, but it, it's like, watch the show, please, mm -hmm. and, and realize that this is real life for people, and get over those stereotypes you have in your head that people in wheelchairs are, you know, not able to live normal lives, like, that's just, that's old school, old yeah. school thinking. Yeah, no, absolutely, and I think there should be, I mean, you'd be the perfect candidate to write a book all about this. <laughs> oh, I would love to. I yeah. have, yeah, I definitely have things in the works of. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm in the process of writing a book, but like about my life and just, you know, whatever, but it's a process and I've worked, I've been working on it intermittently. I, yeah. Yeah. I can't spend like days on it and every, right. you know, with a business and this and that that I'm working on. But yeah, um, yeah no, it's definitely something that uh, I can I relate to that because I have, I have started to write my story so many times in like a book format. And I honestly get bored of it because it's like, and you might relate is like, it's our story. And we it's no, I know it gets boring. I agree. No, no, not, not to other people, just to us. No, I'm talking about for us. Right. For us. Yeah. For it's us. Like, yeah. It's like, right. a, no, 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 for us. No, not for right. other people. It's right. No, like, other people find it fascinating, but like, and that's what, why we have to remember. Right. Why doing it. But yeah, there are so many times where I'm like, uh, it's like, cause we tell our story all the time. Mm -hmm. And it's like, I want, if I'm going to tell it, I want to like, to be super like interesting for my own sake um, to enjoy the process of writing it. Um, mm -hmm. And that's when I realized too, that 
you know, we all have our own spin on things. So once you, you know, get in those inspirational moments and just knock out as much as you can at the time and it will come together eventually. It doesn't have to be overnight, but get the book out there because I want to read yours. So. Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, so lastly, uh, you state you have another quote um, that you stated that I still have the journal that I had when I was 15. I wrote an entry that was basically, I want to die. I can't imagine myself being in a wheelchair all my life. Uh, if you had to go back based on how much you've accomplished and overcome where you are in your life, what would you have told your uh, 15 year old self on that day? Um, it's so funny because the advice that I would give myself is actually advice that a girl came into the hospital, into my hospital room um, mm -hmm. who had, um, who had gotten into a spinal cord injury at 18. And at the time she was 30 something with, wow. you know, married with kids. And she came in to kind of mentor me. And at the time I was in that place where I wanted to die and I thought this really sucks and I am not gonna accept this. And I was in my really dark place and I remember she came in and she said, don't worry, everything you're worrying about right now is gonna become second nature. Mm -hmm. You can live the life you wanna live and everything's gonna be fine. And I remember thinking, yeah, right. like I, I literally remember that oh, she's just saying that <laughs> like, and, and and she even said that. She said, I know that right now you're thinking I'm full of crap. <laughs> and she's like, but I guarantee you one day you're going to feel that way. And so it's funny because I would give that same advice to me, but because I didn't take it in in that moment, what I would tell myself on top of that advice is to wait one more day. Mm -hmm. I, I, would, I would say, hold on one more day. If you can make it through one more day, one more hour, one more minute, one more um, and then reevaluate um, because my journey really was like by a day by day basis, sometimes a minute by minute basis. It was really like, uh, how can I get through this minute? Um, but if I could just, I kept telling myself, I'm going to hold on one more minute, things are going to turn around. And that's what kept me going eventually. So if I could just tell myself, keep doing that, keep waiting one more, one more minute, one more day and see how things evolve. Mm -hmm. And, and when people ask me like, my secret to, um, to my attitude, I guess. Um, I always say it's, it's the curiosity of life. You know, life is so unpredictable. Mm -hmm. So even when you are in such a dark place and things seem like really, really, really bad, it does not sustain it. It, it doesn't sustain it just can't. That's not even how like scientifically things, um, you know, that's not what life does. Life evolves. It always changes, it's always shifting. It's always evolving. And that goes for our choice and our thoughts too. So even if we're really down and we think there's no hope, we can also get to a place where we shift our mentality and it's like, wow, I'm on the road to a lot of cool things. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to stick around, wait to see how this plays out, you know, and that's, um, that's something to remember all the time, you know, and there's, there's always something new around the corner and I'm always thrilled to find out what's going to happen. Like what's, what's Amazing. around the corner? I mean, even if it's a bad thing, I mean, I'm still, well, I'm I'm bad thing's not great, but yeah. Right. But, um, but I'm always curious to see like what it means because I look back on, you know, becoming paralyzed and me thinking that's the worst thing that could ever possibly happen to me. And now I think it's the best thing that ever happened to me all these years later. How, how does that shift? You know, like what, what happens? Life happens, you know, like there, there are changes and there are new things that come in and, and shift your perspective and, um, and change your mindset. And, um, and I, I just, I love it. I, that's the thing I love most about life is that, that unpredictability and it can cause some anxiety when you don't know what's right. going to happen for sure. But I guarantee you, even if it's something negative or bad, there is something to be learned from it at the end of the day. And that knowledge and that new experience is well worth it because that's how we grow, um, gaining all that experience and that knowledge. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Amen. Everything's a gift. Yeah, no, it's true. Everything's a gift. And I wish, you know, there were a lot of other people that could, uh, that could, you know, go with your attitude. I've thought about that a lot. I thought about like, what is it 
that makes that easier for some people versus other people. Um, you know, two people could go through the exact same thing and come out with a completely different mindset and perspective on it. And I think we're built a certain way in some ways, you know, our brain chemistry definitely affects that. Um, but at some point, uh, it does take work and, and action as well, right, to enhance that, even if you, even if it comes natural, like I am a naturally positive person. And and that made my getting paralyzed easier. Another reason why I say it's my perfect life challenge is because it was it was something easy for me. Um, but you know, loss is loss, and everyone deals with that. And at the end of the day, that's what we're all dealing with. You know, whether it's losing an actual family member or um, losing you know your ability to do something, mm -hmm. um, those types of things are complete paradigm shifts for your life. And, you know, you can handle so much of it as far as just being passive, but if you let the passivity stay there and you know that it's not good for you, that's almost worse than what you're going through. Um, mm -hmm. I always say the what could have been worse is me being paralyzed mentally. And I mean that in the sense of like not being able to go forward in life and not trying new things and not going to those things when I was a teenager that I thought I couldn't do. You know, if I got inv invited to a roller skating party, I was like, oh, that's the worst. Cause I was like, that's gonna be so awkward and I'm not gonna go and like, and you know what I went anyways and it was awesome because like everyone could like hold on to me and I could like push them on the ring, you know like whatever it case may be it ends up being like the best night ever. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't have known that if I didn't just push through Mm -hmm. And that pushing through sometimes is the most important um, that like most important action you'll take in life. Just keep pushing forward. Yeah, no, I agree. This is so wonderful, Mia. By the way, I love this your. This is music. so fun. This is so fun.